Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the podcast where we get quite literally the folks who are disrupting the future and helping us build a bigger, better one. Today, we've definitely got one of them. Oliver Christie, thanks for coming today, Oliver. Thank you, great to be here. So we were talking a little before the program, an airport that doesn't give you jet lag, and I'm curious what this project is. Yeah, so this is a spec, a spec project. It's something um, uh, centered around an idea that we can change the infrastructure um, if we rethink how things are done, and then obviously with some data, or rather actually quite a lot of data, and uh, some of the AI tools that uh, are available now and coming. So uh, we already know how to almost eliminate jet lag. It's uh, a combination of diet and lighting and uh, changing up um, your body clock. But um, at the moment you go to any airport and it wants you wide awake so you can shop. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's a great shopping experience, but it's a really poor travel experience. So uh, how would you change these very large infrastructure pieces to uh, better suit what the real need is? Uh, and jet lag is, is, you know, it's a horrible thing. I think I've been affected far too many times from it. Um, so the idea is what, would that new approach look like? And it sort of changes everything inside the airport. It, uh, it ends up with a very different feel. You end up having to figure out if people are flying east or west and then by how much, and then adjusting the lighting and diet and things like that for them on an individual basis. So some of the approach is actually quite straightforward. It's just, what are you actually solving for? Uh, and then what technologies can help and what data do we need? So it's, in some ways, it's not a challenge on a technical front. It's much more having the will to do something new. And that's the harder piece. For the airport side of things, I imagine just having better windows so you had more sun and then switching out the blue lights for red lights would be a big, uh, a big game changer. But how much of the problem is just the incentive structure? Oh, it's almost entirely the incentive structure. Um, airports at the moment uh, make an awful lot. Uh, just from you shopping. So uh, they don't have any incentive to give you a good travel experience. It's, uh, it's something very different. Uh, we've kind of forgotten what an airport is for. So the, the mechanics of changing it are, are easy. The hard thing is changing the, should we say, the legacy th system thinking that uh, it's like, this is an airport, this is how it's constructed, this is where the passengers kind of interact with the whole thing. But we uh, don't ask the question of what's the purpose? And asking what's the purpose um, is sometimes it's a very hard question. Sometimes we've got so far away from what the purpose of different things are that uh, you know simply adding a bit more technology isn't necessarily the answer. You make something faster or cheaper but uh, it hasn't actually improved what that thing is, not just with transport, but uh, you know, banking and healthcare and education and so on. We, uh, it's not the technology which is the thing that solves. It's it's a new way of thinking and a way of kind of disrupting, if you like, um, the legacy way of doing things. So that's a lot of the work I do. How do you get into that mindset? I know this is, in my mind, analogous to online advertising, which I know you've written a bit about, but it's the same problem of incentivizing for the wrong actions and then creating negative consequences for the users. Yeah, I mean, I think advertising is a great example. Um, a lot of data is used, and a lot of people say, yes, it's personalized, it's, um, it's targeted, it's digital. Um, and you've already seen the shift towards uh, Google as an advertising platform. The problem is you still, you still don't have a one-to-one -one experience with the things that are being sent to you. Advertisers at the moment simply want to sell the thing that they're interested in selling. selling. They don't care about the customer, the end user one bit. So you have this backwards incentive structure where you can send me 10,000 adverts every single day. And you know, occasionally one might be correct for me, but because I've been so bombarded with advertising, uh, actually I've turned them all off. I've got ad blocking on everything. And you also can't track me very well. 
So I think advertising needs to rethink its premise. And it needs to start thinking in a properly digital way and in a one-to-one -one way. So uh, there's no point trying to sell me a hairdryer. I will never have a use for a hairdryer. And it's the same for many other products and services. But if you target, if you say, here are three things we think are going to hugely improve your life, in your personal life, in your professional life, the thing which is going to help you today and will make a meaningful impact. And it might be a book for you know, some more knowledge. It might be an umbrella because it's raining today. The thing which is going to help me, well, if you can present that to me at the right time with the right message, so something which is highly tailored to the sort of my tone and how I naturally talk and, and, and so on, and uh, maybe you also have a photo of someone who is a much closer match to me than someone who looks very, very different. Um, the only challenge really isn't on the technology side. Again, it's the will to change up how we do things. See, that's kind of, in my opinion, that's kind of what we're doing, though. That's kind of what's happening and what's gotten us here. It's much more, I don't think ads aren't personalized enough. I think they're getting a little too personalized so that it's, that it's creepy. It's not like Facebook showing you the advertisement for a hairbrush. Facebook's looking at your pictures and saying, hey, you, uh, you're not looking quite so great here. You missed a spot on the back. Do you want to buy this back of the head mirror so that you can shave better? That's, that's kind of more what I see. I feel like we're going, I feel like that's not the problem that we have today. That's the problem that we had five or 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Facebook is interesting. They, uh, they have an awful lot of data on an awful lot of people. And yet, some of it is leveraged quite well, but it's still a type of targeting which is coming from um, the advertising client. It's not really helping an individual in their world. And I'd also suggest that the, the, uh, the images they use are still not very diverse. So it's still sort of stock imagery. imagery which is fantastic if you're firstly white, um, more male than female, uh, you're good looking, you might have blonde hair, or you are kind of fit a very narrow stereotype of uh, someone who should be in an advert. You move away from that um, and suddenly you don't exist. So uh, the, the woman who is African-American in her 70s, she's got uh, uh, dreadlocks and maybe dyed hair, well, guess what? No one advertises to her. It means, so does it really mean she never flies anywhere? She doesn't have a bank account or drive a car and a very long list of other things. And it's partly that there's not really the stock imagery that exists to be able to sell to her. So why are companies ignoring the majority? It's very strange. It's, uh, it, we've got a big diversity problem, not just in when we're selling, but, uh, um, how we're thinking about people on scale. How do we think about the long tail, though? Because that's what helped the Republicans and the Russians elect Trump, is looking for neo-Nazis and targeting them in ways that no one would ever see with terrible messages that the rest of the public would be shocked by. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is for not to go too deep into Trump and uh, what he's doing to the country right now, but uh, it was interesting that the... Um, Republicans this time used data science very, very well. They'd seen what worked for Obama in the, the first campaign and the second, and that this use of data science worked, that the, uh, the results were very strong, and that you can tailor messages uh, to different audiences. The uh, Democrat Party didn't do the same thing when it came to uh, Hillary Clinton. The, the data science team was not as strong as it could have been, and um, Hillary Clinton was not uh, following the, the data signal, shall we say. And I think that's, in some respects, why we are where we are at the moment. Uh, this sort of pushing towards the extreme, but it's also a lot of noise. Um, and I think these are the people who somehow shout loudest, uh, where people who've got a more uh, nuanced message, it's harder, harder to get that out there on um, social media, especially. 
Does that mean the n- fundamental nature of politics is completely changed after this election going forward? I think this is a really good question. I think it perhaps has for a time being. Now, um, for a more balanced view, um, I'm hoping we can have long form conversation. We can have um, rational argument between uh, Republicans, Republicans and Democrats. And I think it'd be very healthy to have a new influx of uh, new thoughts, um, new people, uh, and, and a, a debate where we can actually agree on quite a lot. Where yes, you've got two sides, but um, you don't win by shouting. You win by some joining together of ideas and some um, a more respectful debate around the things which actually matter. Um, I think we've gone in a very very bad uh, bad direction at the moment. I think it's fundamentally impossible with the way the U.S. system is set up in a winner take all majority. You'll always have two parties that have to separate themselves, otherwise they become one party. And if a third party comes into play, they'll always compromise on their morals with the second party to try to become the first party. You have something where to stand out, you have to become more extreme. I think it works in other countries, but the U.S. system might be fundamentally broken. I think, it, yes, it really might be. Um, I think behind the headlines, talking to people in, in politics, in the kind of hard line of things, um, they are more, there is, there is a different message. Um, there is you know, better conversations happening, but uh, in the day-to-day media coverage, um, yeah, we, it, it is a bit of a mess. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up in the UK and that's got a lot more than two parties. Um, so you end up with coalitions, you end up with uh, um, a different sort of conversation that can happen. But then equally, I also lived in Italy and uh, there you have a huge number of political parties. Um, and uh, a system which is <laughs> is a struggle, shall we say, um, with a very different outcome. But I think it maybe comes back to the voter. What do what do people really want from their politicians, from their, their government? Um, and is it able to? Are we able to change the status quo into something better? To have a more nuanced conversation, a more sensible conversation, and I, I hope so. How would you use AI and data science to do that? Um, I think it's uh, it's tricky. Data science, in a way, or AI certainly, um, ends up reflecting what society is. So the data you collect and the way it's used really always ends up um, producing a perfect mirror onto that society. So the things that matter and we could say that commercially and otherwise, are what's built. So there's a huge amount of energy going into um, a more advanced type of tracking, a more advanced type of political influence right now, and it's relatively unchecked. So uh, um, I don't know if we necessarily build it through AI. I'm wondering instead if we have a longer form conversation as to what type of society we want um and then the data ends up reflecting that so uh i think it's a good question i think in the next couple of years it's going to be very very interesting um to see what can happen what trends are you most interested in right now and why uh very interested in hyper personalization so it's really understanding people um, with a huge amount of depth and once we understand everything that makes someone tick we understand from a from a health perspective, from um, I mean certainly voting, but as we un- start to understand people's entire life, we can start producing much better products and services. Uh, education can improve, healthcare and research can certainly get much much better. But only if we think about everyone. So we've got a problem at the moment with uh, with data science where. There's a lack of diversity. There's a lack of diversity in the data scientists doing the work. And there's a lack of diversity in the data that's being used. It's why speech to text doesn't work very well. The training set is still too narrow. Uh, It's the same for uh, medical research. Again, the, uh, the 
testing there, the double blind trial, the testing group is too small. We, we still think in a binary way. Um, so some of my work is uh, looking towards AGI or artificial general intelligence um, and the crossover between that and uh, quantum mechanics. So much more on the software side than the hardware. So as we go from a uh, binary view of the world, binary view on data, um, as we start to look at the nuance of any situation, you end up with a very different looking world, one which is much more reflective of uh, reality. So, What's uh, that crossover between AI, AGI, and quantum computing? Where does that become interesting? It becomes very interesting as you can use it to get a view on the world. Um, so doing some work on risk analysis, uh, which can end up looking at uh, risk, global risk, um, creating a map which is uh, not human constructed, because that's the biggest problem at the moment is as soon as you, you create a map or you are selecting data, you've already biased that data. Uh, and usually you have one question in mind, and that's why you've selected that group and why you look at it a certain way. Quantum mechanics says you can look at everything at the same time. And as you're interested in a particular slice and in, in time or area and so on, uh, you collapse the waveform and that gives you an answer at that moment. So now you can ask as many questions as you like, but you've got a, a very different starting point. It's, it's still quite early days for the technology, but there's some things I'm seeing which um, are having a huge impact. Um, and it's things being used for financial services, um, some things for medical, and some things in defense as well. So I, I do a little bit, bit of work with um, some of the DARPA type people um, and some of the three and four letter agencies. And the interesting thing is they're coming outside towards um, private sector, towards academia, to uh, solve some of the most challenging problems they're having, rather than the building internally, which used to be the case. So uh, some of it is still a different mindset, and some of it's a different research starting point. What's the most exciting stuff that you've seen or heard about that's just kind of the rumor mill? It's not, it's not clarified, it's not out there, it's not something that people know about. I think it's some of the uh, AGI pieces. I think it's some of um, where we're starting to build um, the early pieces of artificial general intelligence. Uh, this is intelligence that evolves. It can start to think for itself. I can use the word think in a loose kind of, loose kind of way, but uh, where it can start having inferences around a situation. So it, uh, we're going from trained to untrained to something new. Um, and that's some of the most exciting because I can kind of see where it's heading. Do you think it's heading there? The way I hear people describing the AGI problem today is more or less taking a lot of processing power and taking a lot of data and throwing more processing power and more data at that with some algorithms. It seems like a brute force method of trying to create AI. Yeah, it doesn't work. Um, just more compute power isn't the solution. More data isn't the solution. Um, our, our brains are limited in size. And it's limited by, um, we can only process a certain amount of data. We only ingest a certain amount of data. It, it's, it's not one of scale in that way. It's one of um, taking a new approach, take, looking at things in a new way. Um, and an awful lot of this comes from uh, the world of neuroscience, neuroscience and um, classical physics. And it seems that the two together um, are very powerful. So it's not really taking a, data, a classic data science approach or even a classic compute approach but it's instead asking, it's asking a new question, but starting from a different position. Which is how scientific revolutions always happen. Yeah. It's never iteration. Yeah. 
So I know you've talked a fair bit and looked into a fair bit autonomous vehicles and where we're headed there. Regulation, free markets, what the ideal and likely scenarios are. I want to hear a little bit more about that and talk more. Yeah, it's an interesting subject in that there are no rules around this. By, by that, I mean there's no no other industry we can look towards to say this is how should, things should be done. So each country at the moment is, or rather a number of countries are starting to look at um, how will this fit inside our current legal framework? And the answer is it doesn't fit very well. Um, I mean, a, a, a simple study quite recently out of the UK was showing that um, people naturally speed. They go over the speed limit a bit. And it's not by a huge amount. It's sort of, sort of 10, 15 miles an hour. Now, if the self-driving car was to stick at the speed limit perfectly, which is the legal thing it should do and has to do, um, it's going to be at a higher risk. You'll have a lot more people overtaking that car, overtaking that vehicle. So the risk goes up. So actually to lower the risk, it should follow the flow of traffic. And it should follow the flow of traffic, not just in terms of speed, but in terms of style of driving. Maybe it's a little aggressive, maybe it's a little bit hesitant, but it matches um, the overall uh, flow of human, human driven traffic. So legally, how do we think about that? I mean, how, how should we think about the fact that um, uh, the programming would suggest that this vehicle should break the speed limit to be safer for everyone? Now, as an individual car, you could think, well, no, that makes sense. But what happens when we uh, program that into every single driving, every single autonomous driving vehicle? It means everyone is now faster. And what if we now say, well, to be even safer, we go even faster again, or we take a different view on um, traffic lights, or traffic patterns, and so on. At what point um, is that just horribly unsafe as it's happening on scale? And at what point will uh, the human driver be um, basically priced out of being able to drive a car themselves because they're too unreliable, um, too unpredictable? and uh, shouldn't be on the road anymore. So I think this, I think there's an awful lot of questions that are starting to be asked now. Um, while technically uh, self-driving cars are doing a pretty good job in quite a few cities and quite a few tests, it's a very different situation to that, to actually having them on the road in huge numbers uh, with a society which is gonna have to catch up to the fact that this looks very different. So I think it's a, a society problem as much as a technology problem. And uh, thinking, thinking about the correlation between the two is um, it's really what's needed. So it's not a sort of black and white, uh, both on the legal or on the technical. So yeah, I think where, where we head is gonna be very interesting. Um, I think self-driving cars in some respects are the most obvious um symbol of artificial intelligence you're seeing this technology is enabling something uh very complicated very human to happen so it's going to be interesting to see also what the backlash is um a lot's been talked about uh, uh truck drivers in the us and in a lot of states that's the number one occupation so what's going to happen when you take away both that livelihood and uh, you know, it's not just a livelihood, it's um, quite often it's someone's whole being is they are a truck driver, it's not just an occupation. Well, it's going to be a challenge because um, it's also going to be the easiest thing in the world to stop a truck. You stand in front of it or you make a very fake stop sign, that truck will have to stop. And uh, it doesn't know that uh, the angry mob outside is going to burn the truck to the ground. So I wonder if there's going to be a social revolution uh, in this way. Do you think autonomous vehicles would be enough? I know in the US, it's like it's like two, three percent of jobs are driving. But if you look worldwide, it's something on the order of fifty percent, thirty percent, something ridiculously high in terms of transportation. 
I think world well in the US it depends of course um, how much a truck driver is is um, how much a truck tr truck driver costs. Um, an automated truck should be able to drive twenty four seven. We'll never need to stop for a rest break or anything else. Um, if that vehicle could be made cheap enough, then the economics um, makes will make sense. I think uh, other parts of the world um, where the cost of the driver is much, much lower, then um, it's not going to have the same impact. I mean, this is it's simple market economics. If a human does a job cheaper, use the human. If uh, the automated system does the job cheaper and relatively safer or maybe about the same, then uh, that's that's where things will head. So. I think worldwide, um, it's going to look very different. I think adoption is not going to be equal, should we say. I don't think initially, but I think if you just take into account the increases in fuel efficiency, eventually everyone's priced out. Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you're if you're uh, driving across India uh, and the truck driver is being paid a few dollars a day, then uh, the cost of technology is, is still somewhat fixed, although it's coming down in price hugely. Um, you know, yes, you've got efficient fuel efficiencies, but equally, um, how many deaths are we going to have, and what does a lawsuit actually cost when well, you can now sue uh, someone like Tesla? Um, you know, we're, we're, what does that really look like? We haven't had very many deaths so far. I mean, there have been some that have been quite notable, but I think it's something we've also got to kind of build in both on the economic model, but also the social model. You know, how many deaths are, are, we, are we happy with when they're automated versus human caused? I think a better way to frame it would be what percentage of human caused deaths are acceptable for robotic deaths, because otherwise people will say no deaths. You have to, you have to kind of trick people into it because it is better for everyone. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, it is, but we're so used to um, the human condition at the moment to think about the, should we say, the machine in the system. Um, it's going to take a bit of time for society at large to get used to this shift, this change. So uh, from a technology point of view, we can explain it and, and you know, we might be very uh, excited about the change. And I think the audience will be as well. But that's not going to be everyone. There's going to be people who I think are very, very resentful. Either their their job is being lost, their world is changing, uh, the things they expected uh, are no longer there. So I think the backlash could be very, very strong. Um, I mean, you, you look at the conversations around coal mining in the US. Well, there's actually more interior decorators in the US than coal miners. But the situation of mining coal became politicized. And uh, equally, I'd, I'd suggest that uh, those people were pretty much ignored um, by politicians. There wasn't a good plan B. There wasn't a good argument that, well, you've got these specialist skills. You've got a huge amount of knowledge uh, doing a job which happens to be very tough and actually quite dangerous. But uh, let's transfer those skills into a new position, a new job. You, you've not been put on the scrap heap. Your knowledge is important. And I think that conversation didn't happen with coal mining, and it should have. Um, and I think the same conversation should start to happen around uh, job loss at the moment. Do you think that conversation happens in any fields, though? I would argue, at least in the US, it's very uncommon. I think it is uncommon, but you, you we talked earlier on uh, changes in politics in how we could end up with a better political system and i think the one of the answers is to have a longer form conversation on what some of these big social changes are happening a proper proper conversation um, not a shouting match nothing like that but much more a look this is the situation this is how things are changing this is how we're going to prepare uh, individuals, companies, governments for this shift, for this change. Um, it's a conversation that is not happening nearly enough at the highest level. 
Who needs to be at that table? Because we can tell from the congressmen that were interviewing Zuckerberg, they know nothing of technology. It's true. Yeah, they, 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 they don't, but they do want to be informed. So I talked to a number of congressmen about uh, technologies, mostly on AI, mostly on data, and what's what's possible, what to think about, <clears throat> and also what would help um, help companies grow in the U.S. So people are happy to have the conversation, happy to be educated. Uh, because, of course, actually, we're also voters. People who, who understand technology also vote. Um, but it's, it's, you know, frankly, it's fantastic for the economy. But the conversation isn't happening. Um, and I've been surprised about this. I, I keep thinking that people are going to say, yes, we, we need to know what's happening. Um, when, I, when I talk publicly, you know, uh, on the subject, um, I'm always surprised. There are some people that say, yes, tell me more, and that you can kind of see that the, they're caught up to the fact that a change is happening. But a lot of people are not there yet. Um, I mean, it's so much so that um, I'm writing a book with um, a professor, um, uh, Dimitri Meniscus, who um, we're thinking about future changes within um, within corporate corporate and business structures. So how is AI, data, blockchain, these sorts of things, what is the impact going to be? And how should these companies change? And the, com the change is quite big. Um, I mean, of course, you know this if you were a taxi company or a hotel chain, you know what that change can look like. We, we have um, Uber and Airbnb dominating. Uh, but the main shift that happened there was one of trust. All the technology made it possible to now get into a stranger's car or sleep in a stranger's bed. Uh, Ten years ago, that would have been uh, seen as a crazy thing. But all you did is have it, you had a shift in um, ideas around trust and society. So I think uh, the same sorts of changes are going to happen across every single industry. Speaking of, I know you've been involved with healthcare in the past. You were part of Google's Moonshot. Where do you see AI playing into healthcare and then the direction of healthcare in general? Oh, it's fantastically exciting right now. Um, some of the public things that people would have seen um, centered around things like uh, skin cancer detection. It worked. So, uh, quite quickly, uh, you are able to look at um, uh, a patch of skin and decide if a mark on there is <clears throat> uh, malignant or not. You're able to have um, more accurate detection of a skin cancer <clears throat> much earlier. And it's uh, um, the machine is better now than the oncologist. So we got to the point now where the AI system um, will be the human. Uh, the interesting thing is that the human and machine is even better again. So man plus machine is pretty much always going to win out. Do now that was a, continue? I think it's, it's absolutely continuing. So doing some work with a couple of other cancers, uh, with uh, different types of MRI scans, and also things like nutrition. So uh, this company I'm working with, um, and they're looking at improving the um, the meals, the school meals for every single child. So you can uh, create a personalized meal plan and uh, you're now fitter and healthier and stronger because you've got, uh, you're eating the right things. Um, exactly the same AI system and structure and data is also being used for athletes. So what's, what works for professional athletes also works for school children. So it's, it's really nice the, the, um, where the technology heads. It can go in several different directions at the same time. Um, but the impact becomes nationwide and then eventually global as well. Is the problem the technology or is the problem the parents? The parents are the ones that are feeding the kids and they know, uh, the adults know they shouldn't be going to McDonald's and yet they do. Um, Actually, funny enough, McDonald's has done quite a good job of um, trying to make their, their meals healthier. 
I mean, there's there's a, there's a demand for this, so they've seen the trend and they're trying to um, uh, improve what they do. There's nowhere to go but up, though. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, we can we can hugely improve, but we can go from uh, improvement in our general averaging kind of way towards a one to one. So um, my diet is going to be different to your diet, but you uh, you ask a few questions on what I'm eating, the outcome, um, you figure out what's good for me. Um, you push that into an algorithm, it's going to have a different different outcome than to you. Uh, but fantastically, if you look at, it's the same setup, the same situation, same data, uh, seeing that difference is, is a big piece. So uh, I, I think that's certainly where we're heading for healthcare in general. It's going to be a new type of uh, targeted healthcare, um, and it's going to be in every single possible way you can imagine. But how do you get people to follow that? I think some of it is seeing the results. So um, um, some of it is uh, simply showing that if you give up some of your data, um, that if you are you know, your data is part of an algorithm, but the result is you're not going to be fitter and healthier and you can see the outcome. I think it's got to be outcome based. Um, now, there's always going to be people who will not want to do this. Um, and I think we look at the vaccination movement uh, to, to, to see people are not always rational. So we're not going to be able to um, include everyone. Um, but I hope people won't be excluded um, due to anything to do with economics or location. Because, the, frankly, the algorithm should be able to work anywhere in the world. Uh, the data can be collected from anyone. And the results can be as strong no matter where you are. So uh, I wouldn't want this to be a rich-poor divide, that uh, this is only something for people who have the money. Um, that, that access should be open to all, partly because actually the results for everyone are going to be much stronger if you can include everyone. Realistically, though, to get this kind of data, we need genetic tests specifically of the, of the nutrient variety, and then we need people doing gut microbiome swabs of some kind to see what their body's designed to process and what the body actually is currently processing. I mean, that's one approach, um, and it's certainly one way of getting very deep. It doesn't necessarily mean, mean you need everyone to be doing that. Um, you can infer an awful lot from uh, that deep approach, but even something very simple, even something uh, along the lines of recording what you're eating and what an outcome looks like, how much you're exercising, you know, even... It doesn't even need to be as complicated as something like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, which is giving you an awful lot of data. It could be something much more basic. But as soon as you do this on scale, then uh, you have a, a much better feedback loop anyway. So it's not necessarily that you need a huge number of sensors to get a good outcome. Uh, it's more, you need more people involved. But the, the answers are going to be answers that we all inherently know. They're simple questions with relatively simple, slightly different answers based off of the individual. Maybe you process dairy better than I do, but in general, we know what works well for human beings and what doesn't. And I think just getting people to stop the doesn't is the big part. Although the strange thing is, if you look at uh, how diet is written about at the moment, um, every single day there's a new health scare. You know, you shouldn't eat coffee. You shouldn't drink coffee, or coffee is great for you. Um, you know, fish will kill you, or actually, some fish is great, and so on. There's this kind of long list of, of things. It's very hard to get to the bottom of um, what this all looks like in context, all combined together. Um, and that's so we're, we're in a situation now where the, the information, the data is somewhat muddled. There's no clear way of understanding exactly what diet I should have. I mean, I get some ideas, uh, some general pointers, but um, uh, that's about as far as it goes. 
I kind of use some intuition, but um, what I really need is a lot more data, uh, a lot more data of people who are like me or, or kind of looking towards a certain type of health. Um, so I think in some respects, we're still quite early in this, in this um, not so much the discussion, but actually the, the data collection part. I like to push back because that's where the interesting parts come from. I know you're involved with the X Prize. How did that happen? Um, so I, uh, gosh, I can't remember. That was a while ago. Um, I was asked to join asked to join the New York board. Um, so the uh, the X Prize I'm involved in is AI for good. Uh, so for good is quite a general term. It's it's really any situation worldwide where the use of AI and data is going to have a major impact on a large number of people or the environment or something similar. So I've been doing similar work out of the UN and a few other places anyway. Um, I've done uh, one a Google moonshot um, and people said, well, if you're thinking about this sort of stuff, do you want to come on board as an advisor? Um, so yes, it's a, it's a fun thing to be involved in because it's really looking towards a very positive future. And it's, uh, it's, you don't have the discussion around money or business or these sorts of things. It's much more, what does good look like? What does impact look like? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice thing to be involved in. What are the most exciting projects you see over there that we haven't talked about yet? Um, really, I'd, I'd suggest because there are so many teams and it's a, it's a global competition, so it's uh, teams from all over the world. I think rather than narrowing it down to one or two cases, um, I would definitely recommend people go and look at um, go and look at the website, go and dig into what the teams are doing, what they're trying to impact and what their approach is. Um, and quite quickly, you'll get very excited about one field or another. Um, but it's, I think what's nicest is you've got people from around the world with different backgrounds solving for some of the most uh, challenging problems, some of the things which are fundamental to humankind, um, and the answer happens to be AI and data. So it's a, yeah, it's a nice, nice place to be. And for folks that are unfamiliar, the X Prize is it was started by Peter Diamandis. It's basically incentivizing people to be incredibly creative by getting sponsors to come on board for large problems that anyone can try to solve. And if you solve it, you win the money. Yes, that's right. And uh, I mean, the prize happens to be huge. I mean, it's millions. Um, but that's not really the reason you do it. The reason you do it is because you're now part of a network and uh, you're. Um, you know, you're, you're building something which is uh, going to have a global impact. Um, and I think that sort of thinking should be encouraged. That sort of approach should be encouraged as well. Um, we seem to be at, at, at a time where the individual or the small company can have an outside impact. So uh, you can build something today that can be used by everyone tomorrow. Um, and you don't have to be from a very, very large company to do it. You, you can in innovate and uh, you can publish and you can be, it doesn't matter your background. So no one's going to say, hey, have you got a PhD from this Ivy League university? It's not really even a question that matters. It's much more wealth. What are you trying to do? Um, and then if you're doing something, how can I help you get there? Do you worry about the power buildup in the the big tech monopolies, but with AI specifically? Um, no. Um, the reason being, I'm still seeing so much, um, so much coming out of uh, universities, of individuals or small groups who are building things which are very, very, very exciting and easily a challenge for the big tech companies. Um, I mean, you, you look towards Google DeepMind. Well, DeepMind, well, it, was, it was a group of people out of Cambridge who came, to came together as a group um, to, solve, to, to think about new approaches to AI. 
and Google brought them up and uh, are starting to use some of those things. But no, I think it's uh, very much the age of the individual. Um, the nice thing is we have access to huge compute power now. Uh, and that's a <laughs> major change when I was trying to do this. You yeah, can up, that's anyone you can up a million dollar server in five minutes and it is almost free. It's almost fantastically cheap. You have access to um, things like IBM Watson. And you can, uh, it's running my laptop right now. And it's same with um, uh, open source AI. It's, um, there's never been so much compute power. There's never been so much access to algorithms and also to data. So uh, no, I think it's, um, I think actually the large companies um, are doing a pretty good job of opening up access. Um, I think Google especially should be uh, uh, mentioned for doing, the, uh, doing a great job of this. What areas outside of your own work are you most excited about? Um, I'm interested when anyone questions, um, questions the status quo, questions how things are traditionally done, does something in a new way. Um, I don't really mind the field. So it could be music, it could be architecture, it can be, um, you know, something immediate. Um, anyone who comes up with a new idea, I think that's fantastic. I think that's uh, very, very exciting. Uh, I mean, I'm very, very lucky in that I end up talking to some very, very smart people about some really interesting subjects. And a lot of it is fairly out there or fairly kind of future, future facing. Um, it's also fantastic being in New York City right now. There's, there's so much energy, there's so much happening. Um, I think it's, it's uh, a case of going out and grabbing that. Um, going out and, and uh, being part of part of this new wave, this uh, this kind of new approach to the world. And that's the good side. But what about the bad? What worries you these days? Um, I think it's ignorance. Um, I think things like the idea that uh, vaccination is a, could ever be thought of as a bad thing, or general ignorance around other countries or other ways of living or other religions. I think this type of untested ignorance is incredibly destructive. I also think it's a great shame. I mean, we have so much possibility right now that uh, to be distracted by what's happening in politics, in, uh, in some world events, um, kind of the day-to-day -day media buzz and social media sort of junk. I think it's a shame. I think we're getting far too distracted and we're forgetting the things that matter in life, the things that matter in, uh, in our own lives, in living, in, in society. Um, I'd hope that will change. Um, I'm not sure if it will, and I don't think technology is necessarily the answer, but uh, I, I hope mostly that we can come together and have a more nuanced, rational, long-form conversation. Um, and I think uh, as you talk to you talk to people, you figure out actually we're all pretty similar with uh, an awful lot of the same, um, you know, an awful lot of common ground. So I hope that's where we had. What brought you here to this, this point? Were you a super nerd? Were you a sci-fi guy? What was it? I actually wasn't a sci-fi guy. Um, I am now. Um, no, I um, I was interested in um, a type of art called minimalism and structuralism, and you end up um, thinking, what are the the features that matter? What are what is the the idea behind the thing? Um, and from there, I was lucky enough to live in different parts of the world, and when you do that, you see different ways of doing things, uh, different modes of thinking, different modes of government. And I think that's left me questioning how everything is done for, for better or worse. So uh, I think my path has been, I always thought it was non-traditional. Um, and yet when I talk to people who are doing similar work, you find out actually it's quite similar.
it's people who uh, have done different jobs, who who uh, question things a little bit, um, who are interested in uh, a new and better world. So, I mean, science science fiction sort of plays into that quite well, uh, but that wasn't really my background. What was the most transformational experience you've ever had, short of having kids or something similar? If you have kids, yeah, um, I don't think it was one single thing. Um, I mean, one, one, actually, one thing that had. I mean, it's it's been some conversations. It's been seeing some of the impacts in technology around the world. You know, case of Africa and so on. Um, that's been very impressive to see. In a purely personal way, something that had a, a, a big impact was um, sort of what was it? Twelve years ago, I was um, traveling around. Uh, South America. I was in Argentina and um, I ended up uh, going south, getting onto a Russian scientific exploring boat, a sort of icebreaker, and got down to Antarctica. Um, we ended up uh, climbing, a, climbing a volcano and uh, sitting on the edge of a vol volcano looking out into the world. And uh, you look one way and there was about four people, <laughs> that was all there was going towards the uh, South Pole. You looked the other way and there was the rest of humanity. And uh, sitting on the edge of this very old volcano, being the only person who'd ever been there and probably ever would be there again, it makes you feel um, somewhat small, somewhat insignificant in the boss best possible way. So uh, I think that's where I sort of found my place in the universe somewhat. Uh, and then from there, anything, you can do anything you can, you know, anything you do is going to have an impact. Yeah, finding a way to get rid of the ego and look at the big picture. Oh, completely. Always beneficial. What yeah. would you do if, let's say you were 17, 18, 19, what would you do? Would you go to school? Would you join a startup? What would be your path today? Uh, my path personally, well, I, I had the, I wouldn't have joined a startup. I, I didn't know about startups at that age in the UK. No, let's say it was today. Let's say we rewound you and we got one into one of those little crazy movies. Yeah. Um, I think I would probably still go to school. Um, the reason being, I, I've realized now how useful it is. All the things I learned, the things which I had no idea would be useful later on and has had a pretty big impact. Um, I think you can always join a startup at any stage in your life. I think you can also do that as well at school. Um, what would you study? Well, funny enough, at, at, um, at university, as well as studying um, advanced math, um, economics and business, um, I studied art, uh, I studied sculpture. Um, and that was a very different way of uh, looking at the world and thinking about the world. Uh, so that's had a, 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 an oversized impact on how I think now. Um, but then at the same time, I was also working as a chef. So um, um, back in the UK, I'd, I'd uh, worked in friends' restaurants since I was, since I was young. Um, and as I was going through university, I was also working part-time as a chef. So it's in mission start places. Um, and you end up with a very different world, a very different... Uh, um, set of things that matter during, during that time. So it was quite nice doing both. We did something kind of um, practical and, and uh, very, you know, very focused at the same time as learning about the world. So it was a, a nice, a nice combination. Any practical advice for people that wanted to get outside of themselves, their comfort zone, their general school of knowledge and expand like you did? I think you've got to be just open to new ideas, to um, to jump into uh, different industries, different uh, different ways of thinking. Some of it is just through books. I mean, there's an awful lot written about anything you can imagine. That that helps. Um, but I think it's also pushing yourself into things you think you don't you, you don't care about, but you try it anyway. 
um, so it might be a lecture, it might be uh, a YouTube video, it could be really anything, but it's it's purposefully doing it. Um, I had one year, um, this was uh, in post-university, and I set myself a challenge of reading one novel a week. So, I know, a proper novel, um, and the book could be any date from anywhere in the world, um, and uh, I stuck to it for a year, and it's quite hard work. And uh, I did sometimes cheat and have something a bit thinner. But uh, I wrote down that list of authors. And then as soon as you start writing it down, you start saying, actually, I want male, female, male, female. And I want uh, authors from around the world, writing in different styles from different ages. And uh, you suddenly see how much variety there is. Um, and how much possibility there is just for the written word than anything else. So that was a that was a fun exercise. That's a really cool idea. I think a lot of people could steal that and benefit. <laughs> ten, ten years from now, what company or companies will be leading AI? I think it's going to be ones which are able to. Um, nope, you got to pick one. You got to pick one. I'm calling you out. Oh, you mean a, a, a company that exists right now? Existing company, or will it be somebody new entirely? Oh, will it's it going to be China. I think it's going to be someone new. I think um, it's going to be someone new who um, uh, is going to be able to challenge. I mean, what we call a technology company today, if you look at a Google, um, they make, what, something like 85% of all their revenue from fairly bad online advertising. You know, that's the majority of what they are is an online advertising company that happens to have a search engine, a bunch of products, and if, a little bit of AI happening. So uh, could you challenge Google? Yeah, absolutely. Apple's a fashion company with a little bit of hardware built in. Yeah, if you, <laughs> if you kind of break down the if you kind of break down the tech companies, I could definitely see how that happens. Any bold predictions 10, 20 years out? Bold predictions. Um, I think we're certainly going to be living in a man plus machine age. Um, I think people's uh, knowledge and experience and also their DNA is going to become highly, highly valuable. So uh, I think you need to be part of the conversation, part of what's happening in some shape or form. Otherwise, you're going to get left behind. Um, I actually think uh, society could quite easily split between those who are accepting of um, this situation and those who aren't. Um, I think it'd be quite a painful split, but I, I can kind of see that happening already. You can definitely see it happening already. Religion is yeah. also a big driving force backwards. That's a, that's a whole nother story though. We don't need to, we don't need to jump into that can of worms now. Oliver, I want to thank you for coming on today. Is there anything else you would want to leave people with before we tell them where to find you? Um, I think, uh, I think really to be curious to, uh, um, to really explore the world we're in. Um, I thought I might give a shout out to a couple of books which uh, um, I found useful and, and I think are very well written. Um, one is The Fourth Age by Byron Reese. It's uh, something of a kind of overview of um, society, humanity, and where we're heading. And that's, that's got some uh, very nice insights. Um, we'll be having him on in like a week or two. Pretty excited. Oh, oh well, he's fantastic. Oh, you, you would love the book if you haven't read it already. Not yet. Um, the other one, which is uh, called The Future of the Brain, is Essays by the World's Leading Neuroscientists. It's edited by uh, Gary Marcus, who um, uh, is a fantastic writer anyway. But it's really interesting. It's very much, it's a fairly sort of tight book, but it's very, very approachable. Um, so if you want an insight into how the brain functions and then where this might head in terms of AI, that's a quite a good early insight. Um, and then the last thing I thought I'd mention is a magazine I love, which is out of Denmark called Scenario Magazine. And it's a, a sort of futurist, futurist view on societies around the world. It's not a technology magazine. It's much more of a what's possible. 
Um, so if you want a very different view, um, that, that's a good one to look at. What's possible is much more important than what is, because well, what is is where it's pretty easy to say where we're headed is some, sometimes harder. Thanks for coming on today, Oliver. It's been a lot of fun. Where can people find you online? Well, they can find me on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also oliverchristie.com. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. Thanks for coming on today, Oliver. If you guys have enjoyed it, reach out to Oliver and say, hey. And if you guys haven't figured out yet, we changed the the name of the podcast to The Disruptors at disruptors.fm. Turns out fringe.fm had way too many UFO crazies, so we had to hop off that domain and get to something a little more respectable so we can have awesome guests like Oliver. Thanks for coming, and thanks, Oliver. Thanks so much. Sweet. That was good. Yeah, great.